Subscribe if you like scary stories. When I was in my early teens, precisely 14 years old, my family made a life-changing decision. We left the hustle and bustle of urban life for the seemingly peaceful realm of the countryside. While my parents painted a picture of idyllic rural living, I was distressed about abandoning the friendships I'd built in the city. Our new residence was in an isolated part of the countryside. The neighborhood kids were scarce, and summer vacation ensured that I was to spend a good number of days without meeting anyone my age. Situated amidst a picturesque country road, our new dwelling was encircled by dense forests and occasionally interspersed with agricultural lands. As I would often observe, cows roamed the fields without restrictions, sometimes even acting as roadblocks. The concept of a neighbor was different here, as the closest house was miles apart. This contrasted heavily with the populated setting of our previous city apartment. At night, the tranquil isolation often transformed into an uncanny silence enveloped in pitch-black darkness. Our new house, a two-story structure, presented a rustic exterior with its wooden paneling. However, inside, it was refreshingly modern. Adjacent to the house was a two-car garage, which, for the time being, doubled as a storage space for our yet-to-be-unpacked possessions. From the vantage point of my room's window, which was located at the back of the house, I could see down a gentle decline and far into the distance. On one of these evening observations, a flicker caught my eye. It appeared as if a distant light, perhaps a fire, was illuminating the horizon. Considering there might be a hidden cabin or something of the sort, I dismissed the thought and turned in for the night. Morning sunlight painted a different picture, though. From where I'd seen the light, there was absolutely no structure. My mind raced, thinking perhaps someone was wandering the vast nothingness. But it didn't make sense. No known hiking trails or campsites were marked in that area. Fast forward a few evenings, and while engrossed in another window-gazing session, my heart almost jumped out of my chest. A vague silhouette, resembling a man, seemed to be hovering amongst the trees just beyond our backyard. Panic surged through me, but I kept looking, hoping it was merely a play of shadows. Yet the figure persisted. Rushing to my parents in sheer terror, I narrated my sighting. They gently pacified me, attributing my experience to the roaming wildlife or an overactive imagination influenced by our recent move. According to them, the unfamiliarity of our new home would take some adjusting. Moreover, they believed that my apprehensions would dissipate once I mingled with peers at my new school. However, the eerie sensation of being under surveillance was unrelenting. Nightly, I'd peep out, half expecting the sinister visitor, but to no avail. Instead, sporadically, the distant light would manifest. Then, on one unnerving night, a series of unsettling sounds echoed through the house. Huddled in my bed, I could discern footsteps. I hesitated, hoping it might just be one of my parents. But on sneaking a look into their bedroom, my worst fears were confirmed. Both were deep in slumber. An intruder was amongst us. Without wasting a moment, I roused my parents. My father, gripping a baseball bat, ventured below, while my mother dialed the police. As we anxiously awaited my father's return, a thunderous crash echoed signaling the abrupt exit of our uninvited guest. Peering out, a spine-chilling sight greeted me. A man was sprinting away, and as he traversed our illuminated backyard, his elongated shadow grotesquely mimicked his escape. The police's arrival, albeit prompt, was a little too late. The intruder had vanished. Relaying my earlier sightings to the officers provided them a lead. The subsequent day, a thorough search was conducted around our premises. By evening, the officers returned with unnerving news. In the woods, they discovered a temporary shelter. It had been this man's dwelling, as he observed us from his hidden vantage point. But what was more distressing was their discovery of several of my belongings within his camp, items we hadn't yet unpacked from the garage. My mind recoiled from imagining his intentions. This revelation stunned my parents. Their prior dismissals of my concerns now seemed gravely mistaken. The ghostly figure I had described wasn't a figment of my imagination, but a real lurking threat. Although the police patrols intensified, the man remained elusive. Occasionally from my window, 
the distant light would reappear. Though our house is now fortified with a security system, the unsettling feeling remains. The man's intentions remain a mystery, but the fear that he might return haunts me. A few years back, my husband Connor, our young daughter Addison and I found ourselves in a situation we had not anticipated. We had to move temporarily to a different house. Why? Our own home had suffered massive water damage because of persistent heavy rainfall and the subsequent flooding that followed. Our lovely abode was now uninhabitable, at least for the time being. We were fortunate enough to find shelter, and for that, we were extremely thankful. The house we moved into was, well, unique. Constructed entirely of brick, this low-set structure was surrounded by what looked like once beautiful gardens, now overtaken by nature, creating a maze of wild greenery. The inside of the house was as peculiar as its outside. The word that came to mind when entering was gloomy. Despite its age, one could tell it once might have been grand, but poor lighting robbed it of any charm. The hallways were narrow and seemed to snake around endlessly. A few sporadic lamps adorned the walls, providing minimal light, and bizarrely, the only ceiling light in the entire house was situated in the bathroom. As a result, even at high noon, the house remained shadowed, and when night fell, it was as if we were enveloped in an abyss. Connor, due to work obligations, had to leave town the very second night. The thought of being alone with Addison in this strange place filled me with unease. The unfamiliar creaks and noises made my imagination run wild, but I attributed my unease to just that, an overactive imagination and unfamiliarity. It was on that evening, a few hours post Connor's departure, while I was bathing Addison, that I had a startling experience. In the deafening silence of the house, a voice echoed, Hey M. Whipping around, my heart racing, I expected to find someone there, but the room was empty. The eerie thing was, the voice sounded eerily similar to my dad's, and given that my full name is Emma, he's always had the endearing habit of calling me M. Hastily I dialed my dad, asking him if he'd somehow come to visit, but he was at his workplace miles away. He tried calming me, suggesting that the unfamiliar surroundings were playing tricks on my mind. Trying to put it behind me, I walked down the dimly lit hallway to dress Addison for bed, but she stood rooted staring down the hallway with a fearful look. When prodded, she whispered about a little girl she could see, a statement that sent shivers down my spine. Distraught, I called my sister over. As we sat on the front porch sipping coffee, she inquired about Connor, pointing to a figure in our bedroom window. But Connor wasn't there. That looming silhouette couldn't be him. My sister, unaware of the strange occurrences that had befallen us, was both confused and alarmed. We decided it was best to leave and spend a few nights at her place till Connor's return. Connor, always the skeptic, brushed off our experiences as mere coincidences and persuaded us to move back. But even he couldn't ignore the unexplained events that unfolded on his first night back. After receiving a frantic call from him, I rushed home to find him shaken. He spoke of the front door banging shut, footsteps approaching him, and the sensation of soft hands touching him, only for him to find no one upon opening his eyes. That was the last straw. We left the house a few weeks later, grateful to leave behind the eerie hallways, unsettling whispers, and the haunting presence of unseen entities. We were more than happy to return to our own ghost-free home, cherishing the familiar sounds and sights, even if it was the gentle slamming of our own cupboard doors in the natural breeze of the night. For over 20 years, I lived in a home that seemed to bristle with ghostly energy. It was a historical structure, dating back to the early 1700s. Its expansive garden, charming outbuildings, five spacious bedrooms, and functional fireplace gave it a picturesque, almost fairy tale like appearance. After spending our earlier years in a constricted terrace with just two and a half bedrooms and no hint of green, this house felt like a paradise for our family of seven. The fact that the house was a steel, 
even by the standards of the 90s, should have probably raised some red flags, but the allure of its charm blinded us to any potential anomalies. Perhaps the surprisingly low price hinted at its spectral residence. Not too long after settling in, my mother, while walking the length of our home's expansive corridor that connected the main entrance to the kitchen, witnessed the silhouette of a gentleman, seemingly from the Jacobian era. He ambled across, only to vanish near the stairs, giving the impression that he passed through an invisible door. This was just the tip of the iceberg. It became almost routine to spot fleeting dark forms in our peripheral vision, which would inevitably disappear when we tried to focus on them. Evenings, particularly after the household had turned in, were dominated by hushed whispers at the foot of the stairs. It was as if a small group of men was engaged in some clandestine conversation. Their voices would cease the moment we approached. And remember, our home was a standalone structure, with walls so robust that even the loudest noises from our tranquil neighboring couple could barely filter in. We affectionately named these spectral conversationalists the Murmuring Men. My brother's nocturnal gaming sessions were frequently interrupted by the apparition of a woman in Victorian attire, adorned with an apron, appearing in his room. It wasn't until later, during some renovation work, that an old servant's bell was found in that very room. Speculations arose. Maybe she was a housemaid from the past, awaiting orders from her young charge. Besides the visual and auditory manifestations, there were other peculiarities. Objects would mysteriously disappear only to reappear in the oddest of places, even after thorough searches. At times, exasperated by these mischiefs, my mother would comically plead with the house to return our belongings. More often than not, they'd resurface within a day or two. Interestingly, despite these uncanny experiences, the house radiated warmth and had an inviting aura. Every visitor commented on its congenial ambiance. However, Things took a dark turn after my parents parted ways. My mother retained the house, making a few modifications in hopes of selling it. Whether it was the restructuring or the melancholic atmosphere post-divorce, the home underwent a transformation. The once welcoming environment now felt suffocating. Shadows seemed more pronounced, and the sensation of being observed, especially in the corridors and stairway, was palpable. On one unnerving occasion, my sister, while venturing downstairs, heard phantom footsteps mirroring hers. Frightened, she raced up without looking back. I remember an afternoon when the anguish-laden sobs of a woman echoed throughout the house. Assuming it to be my mother or sister, I was taken aback to find both of them, engaged in light-hearted conversation, completely oblivious to the mournful cries. Another chilling incident took place when my mother discovered her entire dressing table's contents displaced, as if in a fit of rage despite no one being in the vicinity. And then there was the eerie night when my sister, while cleaning dishes, felt an overpowering presence looming behind her. Hoping it was one of us, she glanced at the old window pane to see a towering figure reflecting back. However, when she spun around, she was met with an empty room. Concerned for our well-being, my mother enlisted the aid of a local priest. Along with a colleague specializing in the paranormal, the house was cleansed and sanctified, which ushered in a noticeable change. The overwhelming heaviness dissipated, and the ghostly encounters ceased. Soon after, the house was sold, and I embarked on a new chapter in a different abode. Today, as I reflect, I can't help but ponder whether the ethereal inhabitants have emerged from their hiatus to greet the new residents. This is a true story, something I firmly believe occurred, though I can't offer any traditional explanation for it. In my early childhood, when I was about four years old, my family resided in a military housing facility in Winnipeg. This was back in the early 1970s. I had two brothers, one older, who was six years old, and another younger, who would have been around a year old at that time. Our home was designed like a typical bungalow of that era. On one side of the rectangular building were the living room, kitchen, and dining area. On the opposite side, connected by a hallway, were the bedrooms and the bathroom. One ordinary day, I found myself sitting in the hallway of our home. From where I was, I could see my parents busy in the kitchen. 
Additionally, the hallway provided me with a clear line of sight towards the bedroom doors. My younger brother was the only one down that hallway, napping peacefully in his room. As I sat there, I witnessed something I can only describe as inexplicable. Two bedrooms had doors opening onto the left side of the hallway. From one of these doors, which was about eight to ten feet away from where I sat, something emerged. To my utter disbelief, an arm that looked skeletal began to extend horizontally into the hallway, appearing at my eye level. It continued to emerge until almost the elbow became visible, but then stopped short of revealing itself fully. After a few moments, it slowly withdrew into the room from whence it came, in a manner exactly replicating how it had appeared. The bones looked disturbingly authentic. Now that I've grown older, I can assert that they had the color and texture of actual human bones, not like some plastic or fake imitation. Furthermore, the skeletal arm appeared to be the size of an adult male's. I was absolutely sure that there were no objects or props in our house that even remotely resembled this eerie vision. My older brother was definitely not in that part of the house, and my parents, who were in the kitchen, wouldn't think of playing such a terrifying prank on a child of four. The movement of the arm was so smooth and calculated it wasn't like someone was holding it or manipulating it. It genuinely seemed as if it was attached to a being, and that being was fully aware of my presence. The gesture, as uncanny as it was, seemed non-threatening, almost like the being had chosen to reveal itself to me. Even though I was so young, I was fully awake and alert, and I knew that what I had witnessed was beyond ordinary. I felt no fear. I was more bewildered than anything else. I had no desire to investigate the room from which the arm had appeared, although it felt like an invitation of sorts. I never shared this incident with my parents, partly because I was convinced they wouldn't believe me. Since that singular event, nothing of this sort has ever happened to me again and there were no other peculiar incidents reported in that particular residence. Years later, I finally asked my parents about that Winnipeg house. They had no odd experiences to report, but did reveal that the previous owner had passed away while serving in the military overseas. So here it is. The only event in my life that I can claim, without a shadow of doubt, was a genuine paranormal experience. One that I will hold as truth until my last breath.